for tuning into ACTI Global's Fireside Chat with Dr. Sylvia Earle. Um, I'm Amanda Terry, your host and creator of this virtual Fireside Chat series, and we're very excited to have uh, Sylvia here with us today. Uh, she's the president and chairman of Mission Blue and a National Geographic Society Explorer in Residence. She's called her deepness by the New Yorker and the New York Times, a living legend by the Library of Congress, and first hero for the planet by Time Magazine. She's an oceanographer, explorer, author, and lecturer with a lifetime of experience as a field research scientist, government official, and director of both corporate and nonprofit organizations. Um, she's the author of more than 225 publications and has led more than 100 expeditions with over 7,500 hours underwater. She's a graduate of, the Flor of Florida State University with an MA and PhD degrees from Duke and 32 honorary degrees. Uh, her research con concerns the ecology and conservation of marine ecosystems and development of technology for access to the deep sea. Um, so thank you, Sylvia, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to give a little background on ACTI, a couple rules of the road for the webinar, and then um, love to have you give a little intro uh, as well. So for those of you who don't know uh, what ACTI is, we're a nonprofit and a community of athletes, conservationists, technologists, artists, and innovators that bring our collective knowledge, energy, and social capital together in active gatherings, which now we've been doing online. Our community supports projects benefiting environmental conservation and economic empowerment via entrepreneurship. Together, uh, in partnership with Mission Blue, we brought to life a marine conservation area in the Brolos Islands of Australia. And we are hoping to bring one together with an ACTI gathering in the Aeolian Islands off the coast of Sicily next summer. This, of course, pending the ability to travel. We've also supported other conservation organizations such as Ocean Elders, Virgin Unite, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, and Lonely Whale. We've also catalyzed gatherings around the world, including the Australia-based West Tech Fest, the Necker Blockchain Summit, and the Extreme Tech Challenge. ACTI was also a partner in the formative stages of the 2030 Vision Project to bring technology and multi-stakeholder partnerships to solve for the 17 UN Sustainability Goals. I think we've given enough people uh, time to get settled in. I see people are, are quite a few people are on. Um, and so just some quick housekeeping notes for this gathering. First of all, it is being recorded. So anything that people are seeing in the chat box, people will see it on the webinar, but it won't be part of the final recording. Um, and we'd also love to make this interactive and have people ask questions. So for those of you that are logged in on your Zoom app, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you click that button and submit your questions, um, I can either uh, message you and you can turn on your camera and ask them live, or if you prefer not to have your camera on, because I know people are on many different time zones, um, I can ask them to Sylvia live. Um, and when you ask your question, you know, if you want to include your name, company, location, I can read those out as well. If you're having any issues logging into Zoom, you can join us via your local phone number that was in your registration email. And if that's how you're joining us, you can email us questions as well at fireside at acti, A-C-T-A-I dot global. Um, so first of all, before I get uh, Sylvia to start talking, Bill, do you want to give a quick intro maybe about how you met Sylvia and maybe give a little bit of background on um, the Mission Blue Hope Spot in the Brolos? Yeah, certainly. Um... Yes, yeah, so I, I'm delighted to be acquainted with Sylvia through Ocean Elders. Uh, many years ago, Gigi Brisson, who helped put together Ocean Elders, and I uh, uh, worked in the same industry. I was a sell side analyst working with an investment bank pitching IPOs in the late 80s of companies that later got to be big, and Gigi was on the buy side. And when uh, she later started her own uh, hedge firm, hedge fund, uh, did quite well. She ended up retiring to, to start Ocean Elders and work on ocean conservation. And one of the first people that she went to, to put together an illustrious group of people was Dr. Sylvia Earle. And as uh, we started to develop our community and our nonprofit dedicated to initially ocean conservation, um, our paths intersected with Gigi. And uh, we started to do joint uh, functions together on Necker Island, which uh, led to further fundraisers and some other uh, activities to drive active conservation, which is part of the ACTI acronym, along with the athletes, conservationists, technologists, artists, innovators. 
And uh, that led ultimately to us working together when the Hope Spot program was created. And there were six or seven spots nominated. We got behind one of our favorite places, which was an area off of uh, Perth, Australia, which is called the Abrolhos Islands. The, uh, the, it's, in some parts of the world, it's referred to as the Galapagos of Australia. It's quite remote. You have to fly, you know, from here in California, you fly uh, 16 hours to Singapore, another six to Perth. Then you got to drive seven hours north to Geraldton and then get on an airplane and fly 70 miles out into the ocean to, uh, to get to this really sacred spot where it's quite untouched and, and beautiful. So with uh, Sylvie's program, we worked to um, uh, get together the kinds of things we needed to have that declared a marine conservation area. And honored to do that with her. So, and I'm looking forward to the next one. So thank you. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, Sylvia, how are you doing today and, and, and where are you? I'm on the other side of the ocean. I'm in, in the continent, I'm in California. So far, far away from where, we're, this is the beauty of being able to meet like this. Although I'd rather be underwater with you. Yeah, well, hopefully, watching. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we can make that a reality um, next summer. We're really looking um, forward to that, yes. Well, th I just want to thank you, first of all, for really making your life mission, you know, saving the oceans and educating people through all of the research and science um, that you've done, basically saying that, you know, everything that's happening on land depends on what's happening um, under the water. And maybe you could talk a little bit like about that to, to open up. Sure, why, why should we care about the ocean? I really wanna just for a moment have you realize that um, the world is blue. <laughs> From afar, it's easy to see that this is a planet that is dominated by the ocean, but because people breathe air, we're terrestrial by nature. It is something that we sometimes don't keep as the forefront of what really matters, but we should. Now we know what we really could not know until, well, astronauts went up in the sky until the last half century or so when we have witnessed changes in the ocean because of what we're putting into it and what we're taking out of it the new discoveries about the ocean, fundamentally, we've learned more since the middle of the 20th century than during all preceding human history. I mean, it should have been obvious long ago, but now you can't escape the recognition that without the ocean, life can't exist. It starts with the water, but it doesn't stop with the water because if you went back to Earth, let's say two billion years ago, there'd be lots of water. There would be a lot of life, but it would be entirely microbial. But it's taken a very long time, starting with microbes, but now this amazing galaxy of life that shapes planetary chemistry, generates the oxygen, takes up carbon dioxide, shapes a planet, in a universe of really unfriendly places, we've got one that works in our favor. But it didn't just happen overnight. But it has literally geologically been transformative, almost like an overnight change imposed by, by us. And probably it started a long time ago, 10,000 years ago, when humans really began to prosper with agriculture and our population began to grow from small numbers to 1800 when there were a billion of us. Wow, 1800, 200 years ago, and 220 years ago. And now look at what's happened. In my lifetime, I've seen a quadrupling of humankind, which looks like great prosperity. And in some ways, of course it is, but we haven't really been mindful of the cost of that prosperity until right about now. I'm not the only one who says, look, we are at a, at a crossroads, whether it's 
news about climate change, about air quality, about water quality, about nasty viruses. Most viruses we really need, most bacteria are responsible for holding the planet steady, have developed the chemistry of the planet that we rely on for our existence. But if you mess around and do not respect the laws of nature, if you will, do not respect what it has taken to create a planet and hold it steady in a universe that is kind of out to get us. There are lots of reasons why it's kind of a miracle that Earth exists as it does at all. And it, it seems perverse that armed with knowledge that we now have, that we aren't just on full alert to do everything we can to maintain the integrity of the natural systems that make our existence possible. But when you look at what we've done to the land, clear-cutting forests, transforming so much of the earth, like three quarters of the planet has already been transformed by human activity. And according to a big study that was conducted by the United Nations with thousands of participants, at least two thirds of the ocean has been impacted. But I can say without hesitation that all of the ocean, the whole planet has been affected by one species. I mean, think of the power that we have to alter the nature of nature. That should make us feel, wow, superpowers. We've taken this whole planet and we've massaged it and we've done this, we've done that. And aren't we wonderful? Look at our cities, look at our transportation system, look at our communications, look at how we've tapped into the energy of the planet to power our civilization, to go to Mars, to go to Jupiter, to send our probes even outside of our solar system, looking back on Earth to see this, huh, what has been termed that little dot, this blue dot of, of places within places that we can't exist. Here we can. It just seems without understanding, although we can't say that anymore. We do understand now. The knowledge is there. We know how to disrupt. Can we make peace now, knowing what we know, with the natural systems that keep us alive? It's like we've invaded a computer. <laughs> and we want to find a place for ourselves within the systems that, that work. Some people call Earth our spacecraft. I mean, it is a good analogy, because here we are careening through a universe that we can't really hop off and without a special space suit or transportation, we can't get to and survive in a place beyond our own atmosphere. Even in an airplane, even in a submarine, we can only go so deep. We need the submarine to, to create our little environment around us or a spacecraft, a suitable environment. Think of it. What we have put into the ocean in a matter of decades. People might logically think, oh, it's those oil spills or all the plastic and all the runoff from agriculture creating, going back to 1950, zero dead zones that were of large account. There were some polluted areas, but scaling up from that to the 60s, 70s, 80s. Now we have at least 500 places where oxygen is so low that they're called dead zones because of the high activity powered by fertilizer that runs off from our fields, our farms, dare I say our golf courses, <laughs> whatever it is that we've loaded things onto the land that go into the sea and are causing problems. Call it pollution. The plastic revolution has been so effective and powerful in terms of the synthetic goods that we use all the time. But there's a downside that we didn't account for and still aren't accounting for the real cost of our prosperity. The ocean, not just out there in the deep blue sea, but the ocean of life within the sea, even in us, in the air, we 
It's not just when we consume creatures from the sea who've consumed the plastic, now getting down to not just microplastics, but nanoplastics at the molecular level that you can take the finest plankton net in the world and drag it through, you're not going to catch the nanoplastics or many of the microplastics even. And they're in our bodies because they're in the air, they're in the water that we drink, the food that we eat. We had no idea that we were unleashing this oil spill into the sky and into our bodies. It's, I mean, plastics are made of oil. It's the other downside of the petrochemicals that we have used to such favorable ends, but also huh, now we know, now we know we can, we can do better. And that's the good news, I think. We are the first people on earth, the first, certainly the only creatures ever on earth to be able to see the cause and effect of what we are doing to planetary processes. You can see a clear-cut forest, very evident. You can see an oil spill, local, really, <laughs> you know, heartrending. But when you pull back and say, okay, what is the collective influence of the trees cut here, the fertilizer dumped there, the plastics, the, and how much we have taken out of the ocean, the life of the ocean that we have extracted on an industrial scale. You know, it took 10,000 years for humans to exterminate many of the big wild animals that were once on the land. It took us a couple hundred years to diminish the populations of wild birds. But we still have wild birds. We've lost many species but we began to recognize in the 20th century that we also have the power to protect. And an organization called Ducks Unlimited that likes to go out and kill ducks and eat ducks and geese and things, they said, well, we get it. If, if we take all the ducks, there won't be any for us, <laughs> whether you like them alive as a bird watcher or as an ecologist saying birds are really important, we need those ducks and geese and other wild birds, or if you just like to go out and bring them home for lunch. If we take them all, there aren't any anymore. And you have to protect breeding areas. You have to protect feeding areas. You can't take them everywhere all the time. You have to respect flyways so that they're critical points, but you know, have to know where they go all the time. Because it wasn't just the laws. Laws are a great start, but people have to believe that it's the right thing to do. Not because they're required to do it, because they want to do it. Birds are now respected as something that people love. I mean, bird watching has become a gazillion dollar business. All those binoculars, all the travel, all the life lists, all the information that is being gathered that gives more than knowledge about birds. We now know, for example, seems logical that these great populations of birds flying all over the planet left little gifts along the way. They deposited nutrients that fertilized the soil. It's been going on for, for millions of years. I mean, birds really began to prosper 65 million years ago when dinosaurs, their ancestors, faded away. And so we've got a, had a lot of time for animals on the land to fertilize the soil with their actions. It's a, a, a system. People should learn when they're kids. We learn our alphabets. <laughs> we learn our numbers. But where do we learn the biogeochemistry of the planet that keeps us alive? Where do we learn about the value of birds in their transport of seeds, their transport of nutrients? And where do we learn about the equivalent in the ocean? We act as if the ocean is too big to fail. And that was the attitude, still is the attitude of a lot of people who think the ocean, that's the best dump site. Right now there's an oil spill in, off Mauritius. So a horrible problem, again, caused by human error. There are laws, they, that ship knew where to go to stay safe, but <laughs> rumor has it that they were having a party 
They wanted to get closer to shore to pick up the Wi-Fi. They went off track. They went on to a reef, beautiful coral reef, human error. So what do they want to do with the ship? They're going to take it and sink it? I mean, the best solution to pollution is to put it out of sight. That won't solve the problem. That's not an answer. And yet that's been the answer for what do we do with our things we don't want close to us on the land? We dump it in the ocean, deep six it, throw it away. Except uh, 21st century, we know there is no way. What we've got is what we've got. And we can see more clearly than any creature on earth or any human before the present time, the, the fix that we're in, but also we know what to do. We do know what to do. We need to obey the laws of nature. We need to obey the laws that we have put into place respecting nature's guidelines. We for sure need to look at what we're taking out of the ocean. I'm not just talking about oil and gas. Getting off of fossil fuels to reverse the, the climate <laughs> catastrophe that we're now facing. Clearly that's action that we're moving in that direction, not fast enough. We need to clearly amp up to take that greatest gift that fossil fuels have given us, which is knowledge, knowledge that we now have to change if we are to survive. It isn't just a better having a, a good life or a better life, it's to having life at all. We're so altering the nature of the planetary processes, the biogeochemical processes that make Earth habitable. That is the bottom line message that I hope I can get across. It's the chemistry, the temperature of the planet, are favorable to us now. But in the times past, during earlier phases of Earth's generation up to the present time, if we could not survive on an Earth that had lots of water, lots of life, but it couldn't support us. And it seems as if we are perversely motivated to destroy, to cut into those biogeochemical processes with our eyes wide open, putting into the atmosphere excess carbon dioxide. We need some to power photosynthesis. And it's been just fine for <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years. But on our watch, my lifetime, we've gone a little off the edge. What we're taking out of the ocean, when our numbers were small and the ocean was largely intact, having people extract wildlife from the ocean for food made sense. The food was there. That's how from the land and the sea we consumed our neighbors <laughs> for mostly plants and it's still mostly plants that keep all of us including the animals that we eat in business. Animals don't photosynthesize. We have to eat something. Most all animals really originate by eating somebody else. So it's logical that we should eat the ocean, if you will, in the early days. But we couldn't prosper at all if we had to rely on wildlife for not even a billion people, let alone eight billion people. Huh. We, we have to grow what we consume and we have to eat low on the food chain if we're going to stay healthy and with nutrients that enable us to be not just survive, but to thrive and be healthy. And we know this, but we still have this mindset that the ocean can deliver wildlife on a scale that we can market globally. Industrial extraction of wildlife. We couldn't get away with it with ducks and geese on the land. We could see that their numbers were going down. We can see it in the ocean too, but we haven't stopped that, that powerful move to extract wildlife from the ocean has taken us to a point where we're changing the chemistry of the ocean. We've turned the corner with whales. 
that we used to take commercially, industrially, till they're almost gone. But we stopped in the mid-1980s on commercial extraction of whales. They have begun to rebound, even though they're under the same threats that we are in terms of plastic pollution, the other forms of degrading the environment. Uh, there are other things that we've done to the ocean, noise in the ocean that is really a powerful impact on life in the sea, including whales. But when you think that one of the most favored, delicious elements in our diet globally today, tuna, it's so common that people just think of, of it as like beans or like corn or like even like chicken, which it is not. These are wild animals that have taken well as much as 10 years to mature. They can live decades if we let them go. Not like a chicken that goes to market in less than a year from, and they eat plants. They eat anything. <laughs> They're little dinosaurs. But anyway, the idea that we can power human so kind with lots of life from the sea is just an illusion. Bluefin tuna, the biggest, fastest swimming of the lot. They, they swim in, on the order as fast as a mako shark. These are two high-powered top predators in the sea. It takes a lot of plants going through many levels of groceries to get to a bluefin tuna. I mean, thousands of pounds of plants at the bottom of this long and twisted food chain to make one pound of a 10-year-old tuna or a big mako shark. It takes about two pounds of chickens to make one pound, of, uh, two pounds of plants to make one pound of chicken. So if you're looking for food efficiency, go low on the food chain, go plants, go plant eaters. We don't raise top carnivores to feed ourselves. We couldn't get away with raising tigers to feed a billion people, let alone eight billion people. <laughs> so what are we thinking? to take top carnivores, or even the little fish that are needed to make the carnivores, which are critical to the health of the ocean. If you think of the ocean of the world as a computer system with lots of moving elements, no part can be removed without consequences. Now, because of the great diversity that the ocean holds, there are checks and balances. We've gotten away with removing pieces we can still breathe the air, sort of, you know, rain kind of falls. The temperature is still within a range that is suitable for us. But we can't take it for granted. We start monkeying with the biogeochemistry of the ocean, taking out, literally, when you think about since the 1950s, how many millions of tons of animals with all the carbon they contain that gets released into the atmosphere. Just when you clear cut a forest, you do the same thing. You release the carbon into the atmosphere and you destroy the carbon capturing mechanisms. Biogeochemistry, hold the planet steady. Don't mess it up. Maintain the biodiversity. Realize that it's not just the numbers, number of individual species, it's also how they work together. When Right now, bluefin tuna are down to less than 3% in the Pacific. Something on the order of maybe, I don't know whose numbers to believe, but let's say it's 10%. That's, that's still not enough. That's since the 1970s. We are so good at, at taking, at killing, at marketing, at consuming the ocean. The real question is, can we have the ocean and eat it too? I mean, can we? Maybe on a small scale, maybe local fishermen feeding their families, communities, if they do it with care. Maybe if you protect breeding areas and feeding areas, corridors over which these organisms, that's the hope of the hope spots of identifying critical areas in the ocean, just as national parks, protecting marshes for birds, breeding areas, feeding areas, places that are, we know are vital to key elements of the 
biogeochemistry of the planet, of the biodiversity of life that makes Earth a habitable place. So the, here we are, <laughs> knowing what we couldn't know before and armed with that most powerful thing, that superpower of getting it. Thank you, astronauts. Thank you, oil and gas industry, for giving us the fuel to get us up in the sky, to go down into the deepest parts of the ocean, and to bring back the news. Things are changing. Why? Thank you, COVID-19. Stop things, even briefly. Hit the pause button. Transportation slows down. People are, you know, not having the impact for a few weeks and the skies get clearer. The nitrous oxide levels go down. The CO2 emissions down. Methane emissions down. The soot in the atmosphere down. People who doubt, oh, we're mere puny humans. We can't affect the climate. Check it out. Look at 20... 20. We've got the evidence right there, cause and effect. All right, so the engines have started up again, and the skies are going dark again. We have the power. Do we have the will? What is the end point of what we're trying to achieve in the 20th century and going forward? Do we want an earth that will continue to accommodate us, then we better listen up to the laws of nature and work within the systems that keep us alive. And we, we can do this. By protecting nature, we protect ourselves. The health of the planet directly impacts our health. So I'd love to hear from you, Amanda, what you've got on your mind. And for those who are tuning in, I could go on for hours, days, weeks, talking about places I've seen, places I love, the changes I've witnessed, and the power we have to go from where we are to get to a much better place. We cannot go back and restore creatures that we have lost. The elements of our big computer, they're gone but we can encourage recovery by our actions, by showing restraint. Who, who really needs to eat tuna? We leave them alone, give them back to the ocean. Now, for those who have few choices, when it's a matter of their sustenance, great. But you can give up the luxury taste that you've acquired for a lot of things in order to gain something that is far more important than a momentary, you know, something that's nice on the lips, in the mouth. Why? It doesn't taste very good when you think of the real cost of our momentary pleasure. The real pleasure is in knowing you're doing the right thing by making other choices. Great. Well, thank, thank you, Sylvia, for um, that very optimistic uh, message that, you know, we are actually able through our daily actions to oh. impact change um, and, and on a much bigger scale. Um, I mean, you've been doing this for, for most of your life, but maybe for some people that don't know, um, you know, Dr. Sylvia Earle was the subject of an Emmy award-winning documentary on Netflix. You should all check out Mission Blue, and that's the name of her um, nonprofit. Maybe you could talk a little bit about its founding, and um, let's talk, you mentioned the Hope Spots. Maybe you could a little, a little bit more background on what are Hope Spots, and how many are there, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. I'd also suggest checking out the film that Bob Nixon directed and produced was with National Geographic called Sea of Hope, where we took kids 
around the country, this country, United States, and subjected them to the ocean, if you will. Some of them had never seen the ocean before, but they got to go dive with dolphins to see the biggest fish in the sea, the whale shark, to go in a submersible down in Hawaii to look at life below where light penetrates, to engage them with a vision of the future they want and to empower them to get busy because they have the power. We all have the power at all ages, armed with what we now know. So it was on a little expedition to the Galapagos Islands that took place after I won the TED Prize in 2009 and was able to make a wish big enough to change the world. What was my wish? To, oh, big ambitious wish to, to ignite public support by whatever means, the power of communication, art, you know, the internet, expeditions, new submarines to explore the ocean, but the end point to develop a network of protected areas, hope spots large enough to save and restore the blue heart of the planet, the ocean, which is where we're at. We need to save what we have that remains of areas that are still in pretty good shape and restore what we can to this, this spacecraft that we're all on board. We need to do a great repair job, but we certainly need to protect what's already working. So that was the idea behind Hope Spots in 20, uh, 2009. And the next year, one man who listened to my TED talk stood up in the audience and said, came up afterwards and said, I think I get it, that if we fail to take care of the ocean, nothing else matters. And he pledged a million dollars on the spot that led to the expedition a year later to the Galapagos where we invited about a hundred individuals, movers and shakers, including Gigi Brisson, <laughs> who had her moment standing on the bow, you know, queen of the world, that what could she do? And that was the vision that resulted in Ocean Elders, which is how I met Bill Tye and the rest continues. But we also came away with the commitment to start the foundation that is now known as Mission Blue. And we have gone from that early concept where actually we launched Hope Spots on Google Earth um, in that era. Uh, we had an initial 12 and then over the years with nominations that have come in from around the world and scientists suggesting places that, again, critical areas, breeding areas, feeding areas, what are those places that have a magnified significance in the greater biogeochemistry of the planet? Okay, so it got to be 51 areas after a big conference that took place in, in Europe. And huh, now, as of August 2020, 131 places, we have developed a protocol working with IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, to have people around the world submit places that they know and love. It could be scientists, it could be, it could be a group of kids, anybody who has a vision and a willing to make a commitment to work with their community, to work with their leaders, to enhance protection for that part of the world that they will nominate and that we will endorse after going through a review with a volunteer group of scientists working with IUCN and of course Mission Blue. And we will further work with them to have data images, stories put into a framework we've developed in partnership with Esri. Esri is this great um, organization that has really in the last 50 years 
developed the, the they call it the, the science of where, the, the geography, the layers of information that you can go to places on the land, almost anywhere, and get information, layers of information about the water, about the minerals, about where people are living, where the hospitals are, <laughs> where the fire stations are, you know, lots of data, data, data that really improve the, the, the planning of what have we got if we want to put in new transportation system, well, what have we already got and how's it going to fit in with everything else? We need that for the ocean. And we're getting there, but most of the ocean has yet to be mapped with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the land or for the moon or Mars or Jupiter. We're getting better. The latest information suggests maybe 15% unlocking some of these databases that have been held private, but we're starting to get into them and incorporate it into open source information. But what if we only have 15% of the land mapped? <laughs> Most of the land on Earth is underwater. I mean, that's the reality. We don't even know the nature of our own planet. We've got better information about Jupiter. You want to know specifically anywhere on Jupiter about what's going on in any one place? Better chance than if you just arbitrarily put a finger on the map somewhere in the ocean like the South Indian Ocean where an airliner went down not so long ago, what's there? We didn't know. We still don't know, although we know better today than we did two years ago because we've made an effort to go out there and explore. But most of the planet is still like that. We don't know what's there, but we do know that there are opportunities either to exploit or to hold steady big parts of the planet now under investigation for minerals. It's an idea, not a new one, going back to the 70s, even going back to the first exploration of the deep sea in the late 1800s by the British research vessel HMS Challenger found manganese nodules in the deep sea in the Pacific and in the Atlantic as well. They, they look like little black potatoes scattered over the ocean floor. Didn't raise much attention in terms of a potential opportunity for economic gain until fairly recently. And now billions are being mobilized, billions of pounds, dollars, you name them, <laughs> units of money to access the minerals that are in the deep sea. We know they're there. But knowing that they're there doesn't oblige us to go tear up the deep sea to get them. It might oblige us, knowing what we now know, to hit the pause button until we have really explored and evaluated all of the values that the deep sea provides. Okay, you can put on the balance sheet that these manganese nodules and crusts that form on seamounts, crusts of cobalt. Eyes light up when you say cobalt because you think batteries, you think green economy, you think, ooh, we need that cobalt, or manganese nodules have nickel and cobalt. And you find other, quotes, rare earths that are now valuable for batteries, cell phones, computers, our ability to zoom like this, for heaven's sakes. But the earth on the land, where there are problems with mining, but we can solve those problems, whether it's human rights issues or you know, transformation of, with ecological consequences on the land, because we can see them, we can get to them, we can impose powerful mechanisms to guide our behavior, to minimize the damage. Who's going to watch in the deep sea and who cares? because it's the deep sea. We can't see it, so it's harder to care about it. Anyway, that's what we're now facing, this illusion that if it's in the deep sea, we can take fish out with impunity because who cares? 
nobody's watching. Nobody's watching or seeing the disruption of the these communities of life. They're the, the way they link to the carbon cycle, connecting the deep sea to climate, whether it's minerals and sequestering carbon or fish sequestering carbon, or they're part of the cycle, biogeochemistry of the planet. I mean, get with it. Let it roll off your tongue as as swiftly as sushi <laughs> or whatever else it is that rocks your boat. Biogeochemistry, it's what keeps you alive. And figure it out, do your homework, and make your choices based on the joy of making a difference. Great, thank you for more background on that. And um, you know, we have about 14 more minutes and questions have been coming in. So I just wanna let people know we will well, kind of continue. Oh, no, no, we're gonna continue beyond the hour. We might stop the recording and we'll, if everyone wants to turn their cameras on, we'll do a big, um, you know, Q and A oh, with wow. Sylvia, who has graciously said she could stay on a little bit longer. So um, I did want to just ask. I know there's a lot of people interested in Acti. Um, Bill put a post out on Facebook about these Aeolian islands, and we got you know, a ton of uh, engagement of people saying, "Hey, I'm in. How can I get more information?" So maybe you could tell us just a little bit about the Aeolian islands. I, I know that was just approved as a as a hope spot, and I know there's a lot of curious people from our community. Um, who want to know more. And it's a working agenda because we don't have a formal, formal one yet. And we're trying to figure out logistics, but open ideas. Yeah, yeah, well, let's have a brainstorm. Aeolian means wind, windy. <laughs> so that's a clue, all of you surfer dudes. Uh, I am a great fan. I usually like to see what's under the surface. I'll look up and see you, you know, sailing by, cruising by, but this is an opportunity, again, to mobilize a community, or people who really care. And one of the things I love about, about what you're doing, Bill, and all of you, is that you're, you're held together by a love of the world, of nature, of the ocean, and of people. And it, it's art, it's, it's the, the sport, the exhilaration of being out and enjoying wild places and wild people. But it's the joy of making a difference. I think that using your individual and collective power. Individually, we can always do something, but collectively, we can, always, we can do more. And that's why I'm thrilled that Mission Blue can collect. We have, overall, we're partnering with more than 200 organizations that are each in their own way doing something. And Esri is one example of developing this framework where you can input data and photographs. It can be shared stories. What I love about our partnership with Octai, Octai is you know, your active engagement with the ocean on with with talents that come from so many diverse avenues and we need them all because going back to what's causing the problems we have some basic laws and policies in place but it's human behavior in the end it's the personal choices that we make it's what we believe is the right thing to do if if people don't believe that the laws suit them, they'll go outside the lines and do what they want. We have outlaw fishing perversely throughout the high seas and even within our national waters around the world. So the laws that might help curb some of the excess and protect our biogeochemistry are there, but unless people believe and are motivated and do the right thing because they know it's the right thing and they feel good about it, you know, <laughs> we're not gonna succeed. So the power of communication, getting people on board and the kids are really critical in this role. It's hard to resist a 10 year old telling you whatever it is that you're outside the lines to get with it, dad, 
Get with it, mom. <laughs> You're messing around with my future after all. I'd rather eat peanut butter than tuna fish sandwiches. Thank you very much. <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, on that topic, just one question from Elise Bernal. Um, first of all, she wanted to thank you for your inspiration being such a strong person who's made your mark in ocean conservation. And you touched a little bit on this. Um, you know, your thoughts about, you know, how can we get people to care more about seafood extraction? Um, you know, people get upset about dolphins getting slaughtered, but they're still eating tuna and lobster. You know, how, how do you bring more awareness to that? Well, I'd like to say, just get over it. You know, it's a luxury it, and it's a learned acquired taste. I don't know who the first brave person was to slurp down an oyster, but because it's marketed as something really good for you and it's really tasty and you see people all smiles when they sit down over a big lobster, but we, you know, people are revolted by the idea of eating grasshoppers. Not everybody, I mean, some people do, but it's a short hop, so to speak, from a grasshopper to a lobster, but people think, Lobster, mwah, let me at it. But really think about it. What did it take to make a lobster? It, it, it takes at least five years, even for the warm water spiny lobsters that are taken from Australia and from Florida Keys and even from Southern California waters. But the New England lobster with the big claws, I think five years and a very complicated life history where they have to escape a lot of mouths that eat them along the way. It's a miracle that a mama and a papa lobster that produce gazillions of little babies, but if two of them make it through to be moms and pops of their own, then the cycle of life is completed. And meanwhile, they provide groceries through those offspring that get consumed over five years, and then even when they're little. But it's a part of this biogeochemistry that holds the planet together. Tuna also, lots of young, but most of them get eaten. They're part of what goes back to, to infuse the system with the right ingredients. Whales have very few young over their lifetime. Sharks produce very few young, but it's the recipe that ultimately enough will get through so that they can reproduce. But the ones on the wrong way go back into the system. We come in and impose ourselves thinking there's an excess out there. And we've taken, you know, cut these big swaths through the ocean. How do we rethink knowing what we now know? I don't think people are going to stop eating wildlife from the ocean on a dime, but I think we will because we must, either because there, we get so few bluefin tuna, we're down to a pretty low level already, that they will become no longer either go extinct, which they could, or so few that it's not commercially viable anymore to take them. But we've seen a, a decline even with these very prolific and abundant creatures like oysters in New York Harbor. They used to be big business in the 1700s and 1800s. And then going up to 1900, what existed then 1900 and what exists in New York today, it's a fraction of 1%. And by 1900, they'd already been collapsing. That there are any oysters at all is a miracle. But there are people in New York, the Billion Oyster Project, growing little oysters, putting them back into the ocean. Maybe someday, if we're really careful, we can start eating oysters from New York Harbor again, if you really want to do that, knowing what we put into New York Harbor. And what you eat when you eat the whole oyster, know what the oyster's been eating, all those microplastics. Same is true in Chesapeake Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, San Francisco Bay, but in each of those places, cause for hope, people are putting back. They see, look, we have the power to destroy, we've done it, but we have the power to heal. We can do that too. The power of choice. I choose not to eat bluefin tuna because there's so few of them. I'd rather see them powering their way through the ocean, being a part of the biogeochemistry of the 
planet that keeps me alive and admiring their aesthetic beauty, their role in the systems that are beyond anything that humans have the power to totally replace, but we can make a difference by letting nature do what nature does to restore and recover once we give the systems a break. There are more whales today than when I was a child because we stopped killing them, at least deliberately. We have other means of killing them, but all the fishing nets and stuff we put in the ocean. I'm, I'm gonna get one more question here from the audience and then just a reminder, if everyone wants to stay on, we will at the end stop the recording and then um, we, Dr. Earl said she can stay on for a little bit so we can get more questions answered. So I, I know that there's a lot coming in and um, appreciate everyone uh, just stay on uh, as we finish. Um, uh, this is a question from Andrea Palacio. Uh, wanted to know your, because you mentioned the Galapagos earlier, but what's currently going on. I think there's 340 fishing fleets that are overfishing. And I guess if you're not in that region, you know, what can we all be doing to help fight that? What are they fishing for? Tuna. They're getting sharks as well. When they set the long lines, there's no sign on the hook. You know, these long lines extend for you know, tens of kilometers, uh, sometimes 60 or 70 kilometers with baited hooks every few feet. There's no sign that says only tuna need to bite. And even if just tuna did bite, it would still be a travesty. But turtles bite, dolphins bite, sharks bite. They get a huge amount of bycatch, by kill. It's true when you drag a net similarly not just the targeted species, you destroy vast areas that don't instantly bounce back and take a lot of creatures that are thrown away, just killed in the process. So every time you enjoy that little shrimp cocktail, whether it's from dragging the ocean or there's a high cost to cultivated shrimp too, another whole issue about aquaculture. There's smart aquaculture and then we ought to be pushing in that direction if we want to eat sea animals. There's a way carefully to do it, but most of it is not being done carefully. And just do your homework. That's the answer, I think. In the Galapagos, these are, we need law of the sea to be in, encompass high seas fishing that is now illegal, unreported, and unregulated. It's the wild west out there. But even legal fishing is a huge problem. And there are efforts underway right now to try to have large areas that are off limits to fishing of any kind. But why not have the entire high seas area, half the world high seas beyond the area of national jurisdiction that we keep as the common heritage, the common protector of the biogeochemistry of the planet? Leave it alone. Let the tuna swim. Let the sharks do their thing. Let the plankton flourish. Do not dive down and wreck the gardens of manganese nodules on the sea floor, where leases are now being distributed to companies that want to go for their short-term gain, the world's long-term loss, the, the minerals that are there causing damage anyway we we need to the person who asked the question do exactly what you're doing get tuned in to what the problems are the fishing fleets that are now right at the edge of the exclusive economic zone of what ecuador claims around the galapagos islands they are really taking creatures who don't know where the boundaries are but because they're inside the EEZ of Ecuador doesn't protect them. They swim in and out. And when they come right on the edge, you look at the lights of the fishing boats out there. They're, they're, it's like there is a line in the sea. Imagine if we didn't know. Imagine if we didn't know about the squid fleets in North Korea that are coming from China and taking 90% 
of the squid. Why don't we leave the squid alone? The squid are part, again, critical conduits of the chemistry of, of the, the ocean and therefore of the planet. We, why can't we understand? And, and maybe you, who asked the question, can help the community around you understand. Ask the right questions. Do your homework and be an ambassador. And it is how things happen when you get momentum up to the tipping point where people, enough people care that things do change. They can change. Hope, hope spots, Galapagos Islands. They're, it's a big blue hope spot. We need to protect it. Thank you again, uh, Sylvia, for joining us and for, to me at least, giving a very inspirational message that we can all make a difference through our, through our daily actions. And just, as you said, tuning in and being aware of these issues and joining and learning more about them and educating other people is, is kind of what we need to be doing. So um, appreciate that. I, I wanna, again, if everyone wants to stay on, we will um, continue the discussion um, and we'll stop recording shortly. Um, obviously this recording will be up on the ACTI website um, soon. And if you um, are on this, you should have, you will be receiving our newsletter as well. So um, that will, that will um, also have this recording. And our next Fireside Chat is going to be in two weeks, um, September 2nd. Uh, we have Roham Garagozlu, who is the founder and CEO of Dapper Labs. For those of you who are not in the crypto space, um, that's the company that created CryptoKitties. Um, which you can kind of think as of as a, a digital beanie baby, but you know some of those are fetching, fetching more than um, three hundred thousand um, dollars, as well as upcoming titles like NBA Top Shot and the Flow Blockchain. Um, we're going to talk about their recent investment from the NBA of twelve million dollars and basically how they're kind of inventing a new model of collectibles um, and gaming and really transforming the way uh, what, what fa fandom represents. Um, so you can register for that on our website, which is uh, Acti Global Fireside Chats. And until our next Fireside Chat, please stay healthy, stay inspired, and keep spreading the message that um, we've been learning from Dr. Earl today. And as, if people want to stay on, we'll promote you to panelists and we'll, we'll continue the discussion.